by the light of a tallow candle which had been placed on one end of a rough table a man was reading something written in a book <coughs> it was an old account book greatly worn and the writing was not very intelligible for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light on it the shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity half the room darkening a number of faces and figures for besides the reader eight other men were present seven of them stood against the rough log walls silent and motionless and the room being small not very far from the table by extending an arm any one of them could have touched the eighth man who lay on the table face upwards partly covered by a sheet his arms at his sides he was dead the man with the book was not reading aloud and no one else spoke all seemed to be waiting for something to occur the dead man only was without expectation from the blank darkness outside came in through the aperture that served for a window all the ever unfamiliar noises of the night in the wilderness the long named notes of a distant coyote the pulsing thrill of tireless insects in the trees the strange cries of night birds so different from those birds of the day the drone of the great blundering beetles and all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem to have been but half heard when they have suddenly ceased as if consciousness of an indiscretion but nothing of all that was noted in that company its members were not over much addicted to idle interest in matters of no political importance that was obvious in every line of their rugged faces even in the dim light of the single candle they were evidently men of the vicinity farmers and woodsmen the person reading was a trifle different one might have said of him that he was of the world albeit there was that in his atea which attested to a certain fellowship with the organisms of his environment his coat would have hardly passed any muster in San Francisco his footgear was not of urban origin and the hat that lay by him on the floor was such that if one had considered it an article of mere personal adornment he would have missed its meaning incontinence the man was rather pre-proposing was just a hint of sternness though that may have assumed or cultivated as appropriate to one in authority for he was a coroner and it was by virtue of his office that he had possession of the book in which he was reading it had been found among the dead man's effects in his cabin where the inquest was now taking place when the coroner had finished reading he put the book into his breast pocket at that moment the door was pushed open and a young man entered he clearly was not of mountain birth and breeding was clad as those who dwell in cities his clothing was dusty however as from travel he had in fact been riding hard to attend the inquest the coroner nodded no one else greeted him we have waited for you said the coroner it is necessary to have done with this business tonight the young man smiled I'm sorry to have kept you he said I went away not to evade your summons but to post my newspaper an account of what I suppose I am called back to relate the coroner smiled 
The account that you've posted to your newspaper, he said, differs, probably, from that which you will give here under oath. That, replied the other, is as you please. I used manifold paper, and I have a copy of what I sent. It was not written as news, for it is incredible, but as fiction. It may go as part of my testimony under oath. But you say it is incredible. That's nothing to you, sir, if also I swear that is true. The coroner was silent for a time, his eyes upon the floor. The men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers, but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse. Presently, the coroner lifted his eyes and said, We will resume the inquest. The men removed their hats. The witness was sworn. What is your name? the coroner asked. William Harker. Age? 27. You knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. You were with him when he died? Near him. How did that happen? In your presence, I mean. I was visiting him at this place to shoot and fish. Part of my purpose, however, was to study him and his odd, solitary way of life. He seemed a good model for my character in fiction. I sometimes write stories. I sometimes read them. Thank you. Stories in general, not yours. <laughs> Some of the jurors laughed. Against the sombre background humour shows highlights. Soldiers in the intervals of battle laugh easily. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witnesses understood. Pulling a manuscript from his breast pocket, and he held it near the candle, turning the leaves until he found the passage that he wanted to begin to read. The sun had hardly risen when we left the house. We were looking for quail, each with a shotgun, but we only had one dog. Morgan said that our best ground was beyond a certain ridge that he pointed out, and we crossed it by a trail through the chaparral. On the other side was a comparatively level ground, thickly covered with wild oats. As we emerged from the chaparral, Morgan was but a few yards in advance. Suddenly, we heard, at a little distance to our right, and partly in front, a noise of some animal thrashing about in the bushes, which we could see was more violently agitated. We've startled a deer, I said. I wish we'd brought a rifle. Morgan, who had stopped, and was intently watching the agitated chaparral, said nothing, but had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim. I thought him a trifle excited, which surprised me, for he had a reputation for exceptional coolness, even in moments of sudden peril. Oh come, I said, you're not going to fill up a deer with a quail shot, are you? Still, he did not reply, but catching a sight of his face, as he turned it slightly towards me, I was struck by the intensity of his look. Then I understood that we had a serious business on our hands, and my first conjecture was that we had jumped a grizzly. I advanced to Morgan's side, cocking my piece as I moved. The bushes were now quiet. 
and the sounds had ceased. But Morgan was as attentive to the place as before. What is it? What the devil is it? I asked. That damned thing, he replied, without turning his head. His voice was husky and unnatural. He visibly trembled. I was about to speak further when I observed the wild oats near the place of the disturbance moving in the most unexpected way. I can hardly describe it. It seems as if I'd stirred a streak of wind, which not only bent it, but pressed it down and crushed it so that it did not rise. At this moment, slowly prolonging itself in its direction towards us. Nothing that I'd ever seen had affected me so strangely as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon. Yet I'm unable to recall any sense of fear. I remember and tell it here because, singularly enough, I recalled it then once and looking carelessly out of an open window, I momentarily mistook a small tree close at hand for a group of larger trees a little distance away. It looked to the same size as the others, but being more distinctly and sharply defined in mass and detail, seemed out of harmony with them. It was a mere falsification of the law of aerial perspective, but it startled and almost terrified me. We so rely upon the orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seemingly suspicion of them is noted as a menace to our society, a warning of unthinkable calamity. So now, the apparently causeless movement of the foliage began to move again. Its undeviating approach of the line of disturbances were distinctly disquieting. My companion appeared actually frightened, and I could hardly praise my senses when I saw him suddenly throw his gun to his shoulder and fire both barrels at the agitated grain. Before the smoke of the discharge had cleared away, I heard a loud savage cry like scream. Like that of a wild animal, and flinging his gun upon the ground, Morgan sprang away and ran swiftly from the spot. At the same instant, I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen. In the smoke, some soft, heavy substance that seemed to throw against me with great force. Before I could get upon my feet and recover my gun, which seemed to have been struck from my hands, I heard Morgan crying out as if in mortal agony and mingling with his cries were such hoarse, savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs. <coughs> Inexpressibly terrified, I struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of Morgan's retreat and may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that. At a distance less than 30 yards was my friend, down upon one knee, his head thrown back at a frightful angle, hatless, his long hair in disorder and his whole body in violent movements from side to side, backwards and forwards. His right arm was lifted and seemed to lack the hand at least. The other arm was invisible. At times, as memory now reports this extraordinary scene, I could discern but a part of his body. It was as if he had been partly blotted out. I cannot otherwise express it. Then shifting of positions would bring it all into view again. All of this must have occurred within a few seconds. Yet, in that time that Morgan assumed all the postures of a determined wrestler vanquished by superior weight and strength, I saw nothing but him, and him not always distinctly. During the entire incident, his shouts and cries were heard, as if through an enveloping uproar of such sounds of rage and fury as I had never heard from the throat of a man or brute. For a moment I only stood irresolute, then throwing down my gun, I ran forwards to my friend's assistance. I had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit, or some form of convulsion. 
but before I could reach to his side, he was down and quiet. All sounds had ceased, but with a feeling of such terror, as even these awful events had not inspired, I now saw again the mysterious movement of the wild oats, prolonging itself from the trampled area near towards the edge of the wood. It was only when I had reached the wood that I was able to withdraw my eyes and look at my companion. He was dead.